Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to the second webinar in the Healthy Building series that's been brought to you by Built Environment Smarter Transformation, which was formerly the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, and Wood for Good. For those of you on the webinar today who don't know me, uh, my name is Jennifer Smart. I'm Head of Sustainability Programmes at BEST, um, and I'm delighted to be hosting this session today. Um, we have three fabulous speakers for you. Uh, we have Andy Hayne, David Storing, and Beverly Quinn, who are going to take you through a series of projects where the use of timber and biophilic design was a significant consideration when looking at the health and well-being of building users. Um, but before we get into the nitty gritty, I've just got a quick bit of housekeeping for you. Um, th this is being recorded, so it will be available to everybody on um, the webinar um, in the coming days. Um, we want to be as interactive as possible, so there's a couple of polls that we'll show. So we, you know, we really um, hope that you participate in those. Um, and questions, we'll do them in a panel session at the end. So there is a little box at the side. So if you can type any questions in there, I will pick them up and we'll ask them of our panelists at the end of the presentation section. So hopefully that's okay with everybody. Um, so we're going to go straight into a poll before our first speaker. Danielle, if I get you to put that up for us. There we go. So if everybody can um, participate. So what do you think or do you think about health and well-being in relation to buildings? Is that something that you consider? Uh, yes, all the time, sometimes, rarely or not at all. Um, it's almost instantaneous, this. So as you vote, the, um, the results will appear on the screen. Oh, there we go. Oh, very good. Everybody very health and safe, uh, very health and well-being conscious when it comes to the environment that they are working and living in. So um, that is fantastic to to see. So um, enough of me. Um, this is not why you're here um, on on the webinar. So I'll move on to our first presentation of today. So I would like to introduce Andy Hain, who is the director of Hain Tillet Steel. Um, Andy is a structural engineer with over 25 years industry experience. Andy has championed modern, modern methods of construction throughout his career, promoted the use of engineered timber since 2000, and worked alongside some of the UK's leading architects on the delivery of complex and highly sustainable timber buildings. Andy leads Hain Tillett Steel's Timber Focus Group, which undertakes research and technical investigations into low carbon timber construction, he also contributes to leading industry events and authors thought leadership articles for the Structural Timber Association, New London Architecture and the GNT Mass Timber Office Forum. So Andy, I can see you're now sharing your screen. So I will go on mute and over to you. Thank you. Thanks for the intro, Jen. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Afternoon, everyone. Um, so initially when I was asked to speak today, I was worried about how much I could contribute as a structure engineer. Um, you know, our fundamental task is to make buildings stand up. Um, and I used to use the anatomical analogy that we design the bones of a building and many engineers design the organs and the circuitry systems and architects add the flesh to hide all the ugly stuff and make things look nice. Um, I spent the first half of my 28 years in practice designing structure to be hidden away by better looking materials. Um, so more recently, um, however, designers and end users have completely flipped the brief and I can barely remember the last time I designed an office where a suspended ceiling was going to cover up the structure. Um, quite the reverse and in refurbishment projects, the first move is now to remove the ceiling and the plaster from the slabs and the walls, expose the structure and the mechanical and electrical services in all their engineering glory. Um, I often wonder what changed and why as humans or perhaps society, we often now prefer to live and work in spaces that are almost brutally honest and um, surrounded by the bumps and scratches and splits of the natural materials. Um, is it fashion or fad, you know, born out of warehouse, warehouses in New York and Shoreditch or something that might switch back again one day? Or is it something more tactile or subliminal and intrinsic, um, more in sync with our evolutionary development or allowing us to operate in all ways more comfortably and in tune with our you know, natural biological flow? Um, so let me just see if I'm, sorry, I can't see my, there we go, apologies. Um, so yeah, I had a look on the Wood for Good website and what health and well-being means. And um, I think in this context, we're talking about how our built environment can contribute positively to our physical and mental condition. 
Um, and there are better people than me speaking today who can tell you about how intelligent interior design plays perhaps the most important part in this. So I thought it might be a good chance for me as a structural engineer talking at a Wood for Good event to give my opinion on why exposed natural materials, and in particular engineered timber, are not only improving people's kind of working conditions and associated health and well-being, but also contributing to the wider reaching health and well-being of the planet. So this is my first kind of technical slide, and this shows you um, lifestyle choices per person per year and the changes that we make. So eating a plant-based diet saves 0.8 tonnes of carbon, living car-free, 2.4 tonnes of carbon, having one fewer child, 58 tonnes of carbon. Um, but if you compare that with my influence or potential influence as a structure engineer, um, I would specify over 1,000 tonnes of carbon um, per year. Um, so you can see, you know, the, the decisions that I make and, and how, um, you know, important they are and the responsibility I have as a structural engineer to, to get them right um, for the benefit of the planet. So this shows the kind of, you're probably familiar with Letty and Reba targets for carbon in kilograms of carbon per square meter on a, on a development. Um, and currently, you know, we're at the red end looking at this kind of EPC scaling system. Um, and what we need to do as a society and industry is shift that peak into the green zone if we're going to hit the 2030 Letty targets and we're going to limit um, you know temperature rise globally by one and a half degrees C um, so we've got quite a job on our hands just looking at the bottom right you can see a table there where we've equated that down through to a um, an allowance as a structure engineer um, for a development um, from 500 kilograms of CO2 a square meter down to 190 so we've got a lot of work to do in the next seven or eight years um, to, to kind of hit those targets. Remember that 190, which is a 2030 Letty target, because that, I'll show you some examples of how we can do that as structural engineers. Um, but just to talk a little bit about engineered timber, what are the benefits of it? I think hopefully these are quite apparent to our listeners, but um, we start with program. It's faster because it's dry construction um, and it's prefabricated off site. So it comes to site goes up super fast. Um, it's obviously sustainable, I say obviously, but it's a renewable material. Um, it absorbs carbon dioxide as it grows. That is then locked in or stored or sequestered in that timber throughout its life in a building uh, until end of life. And even then potentially it can be reused. That's the target of a circular economy um, on the next building. So we don't have to release that into the environment for generations of buildings to come. Um, healthy um, and I think there'll be a lot more talk about that today um, in terms of working in an environment where you're surrounded by these natural materials and how it feels. Um, there's a marketing advantage we see now. Um, tenants are asking developers, developers are asking uh, consultants to deliver timber buildings because they sell quicker, maybe they sell for more value, maybe less so at the moment but I see that as a future trend. We're doing a lot of developments where we have part refurb, part extend in timber, and it's the timber floors that get let first because of their attractiveness um, and um, their alignment with tenants, e e ESGs, et cetera. Um, and also it's lightweight. So if you are again doing this kind of um, double combo of refurb and extend in engineered timber, um, having lightweight extension solutions allows you to potentially add extra floors without um, additional strengthening. So a massive benefit. Um, Challenges that we come across regularly, um, water um, during construction and also post-construction, potentially with leaky roofs, um, leaky showers, toilets, etc. cetera. Um, that's in, on an insurer's mind as probably a joint um, significant risk of timber uh, in, in, in conjunction with fire. Obviously, it's a combustible material um, uh, more so than steel or concrete, so needs closer consideration and actually more highly tuned kind of uh, fire engineered solutions and analysis to, to make sure that what we're doing is still safe. I think there's a, I would call it a slight misconception of increased cost, um, but we're finding that um, actually if you put it in conjunction with program savings, that cost is, that cost increase is essentially wiped out and potentially in terms of additional value, as I mentioned the marketability before, um, I, I'm not sure there is a net increased cost. Um, acoustics, because it's lightweight, the downside is that you have problems in particular with airborne separation between floors, arguably less durable, and connections and detailing are much uh, harder. 
it's also likely to be exposed if we're if we're trying to get the kind of well-being aspects from it and so connection detailing takes a lot more perhaps thought and consideration than other types of structures such as steel etc and you can see there the kind of the big um, choke point that we're in, coming across in the industry at the moment is um, insurance and achieving insurance more of the finished asset than actually of the construction phase. And we need to um, come up with some proactive responses to the water and fire risks, which we have, I would say, you know, good solutions working with all of our kind of des design friends and colleagues. Um, and we are able to now respond positively to insurers and, and, and get them on board. Um, so just looking at other materials, so it, if timber we think is low carbon and a great solution, um, how do concrete and steel, the other sort of structural primary materials compare? Well, the problem with concrete is that even though 14% of the um, mass um, of the material is cement, 97% of the carbon cost of that material is cement. So we've really just got to concentrate on how we can reduce the cement in the in the concrete. Um, and there's various cement replacements, the two most popular being GGBS, ground granulated blast furnace slag, um, and PFA, pulverized fuel ash, um, and they come respectively from the steel industry and the coal industry, both of which we're trying to scale down because they in themselves are intensive and these materials are a byproduct. Um, also, there is a limited um, quantity of GGBS, so you can see there that um, recycled aggregates are not worthwhile. Um, GGBS fully used at 13% um, cement replacement. So, so we're having to import it from the EU and from China. Um, there's a finite amount of it. So if you specify more in your job, somebody else is getting less. So there's no um, sort of global saving. And a similar story with steel, where there are two um, manufacturing processes, either blast oxygen furnace or, or electric arc furnace. Um, the latter is is about half the carbon um, intensity, partly because of the electric um, manufacturing processes that are used, but also because it uses increased amount of recycled steel. Um, but the downside is there's only enough scrap to meet 30% of that demand. And so actually, if you specify more recycled steel on your job, then you are not adding, if somebody else is specifying less and you're not saving the planet in any fashion. So they're not really, even though they say they're low carbon EAF and GGBS, you're not really getting a, a low carbon solution. Um, what we've done at HTS is, is we've benchmarked a series of um, uh, different types of construction in, in a couple of the key sectors, residential and office. So this is resi. Um, you're looking at the most common construction is flat slab. There are ways you can reduce the cement, cement content on the second option uh, and make thinner slabs using PT, et cetera, on the third option. And you're systematically kind of reducing the carbon cost in kilograms of square meter. Um, remember that Letty figure was up at around 190, but these figures are based on base studies only. So by the time you add the abnormals of substructure cores, et cetera, these are looking more like double. So these aren't these first three options aren't really within um, Letty or Reba kind of 2030 targets. Then you've got sort of timber alternatives using CLT um, typically, um, full CLT or even um, hybrid with like gauge steel, like a SIGMAT system, for example. Now, the problems that we've got in residential, and this is my kind of crude timeline of what's happened with engineered timber and construction, is that with residential, the green line, we started, you know, using lots and lots of engineered timber, CLT, Dalston, you know, um, some fantastic projects. And then obviously, tragically, Grenfell happened. And as a result of that, the building regs changed um, and non-combustibles, uh, oh, combustibles, apologies, weren't allowed to be used in the external walls of buildings over, resi buildings over a certain height. Um, so that now, even though we've now got these technical solutions like SIGMAT, where we can use light gauge steel in those external walls, the confidence isn't there from insurers, from funders, and it's relatively speaking a sort of a dead market for engineered timber. I'd like to think that it will continue to grow. We'll get that confidence back, which is why I've shown this line kind of starting to, to rise a little bit, but, but it's not looking great. Conversely, what we found is that, um, and literally kind of at the same time as it was falling off a cliff in resi, in office, um, it shot up. Um, whether that's driven by you know increased emphasis on embodied carbon in the industry or whether it's from tenants um, demanding of their uh, developer kind of um, landlords that they have buildings that represent their ESGs and their environmental kind of um, you know sort of uh, targets um, but nonetheless we're finding 
most jobs now we start with timber on the table um doesn't last the whole journey but but um it's something that we consider um throughout and here you can see some of the benchmarking we've done on typical solutions in offices where we've got about 90 um using um fully engineered timber which is you know almost half a letty um albeit that you might have to sort of double these figures but we're still in and around the letty um targets which is fantastic then steel and clt is actually not a lot better but it is better than um concrete with um, cement replacement um so let me just show you a couple of case studies um well firstly just as i mentioned before um how we are increasingly being um, asked to look at whether engineered timber is viable on on some solutions and projects that we're working on um last count we did i think we had over two million square foot of offices um with engineered timber hybrid or fully framed which essentially means at least clt slabs throughout um yeah two million square foot um on the drawing board so you can see some large projects here 15 stories with landsec in southwark um steel frame with clt slabs we've got a couple of completed jobs on center and right which are east india dock the republic development existing buildings previously owned by tower hamlets that we've extended and infilled and beautified using engineered timber and Think you'd agree with some of those images they're just fantastic looking um and we probably all like to to work in places like that um then we've got lots on the drawing board uh, uh, working with argent related at brent cross town where their brief is to have timber or timber hybrid development to create a sort of a, a truly kind of pioneering um you know sort of um business estate um and which is a fantastic brief and we're coming up with some different solutions there whether it's fully timber framed or perhaps it's we've got precast stick frames with clt slabs uh, and then you, you see a lot of jobs in private housing in 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 education where engineered timber is used and exposed and the benefits that go with that are incredible you know improved learning concentration schools etc um so just a couple slightly more detailed case studies this is um, one we just finished recently um the gramophone works in kensal rise um with resolution property and studio rhe architects is existing warehouse building three stories very heavy it was a paint factory i believe and then a record uh uh kind of studio um you know, sub use uh, more recently and we've extended it to the sides and, and on top so a three-story building we put four floors on top without strengthening the existing building partly because that building was designed for high loads in the first place but partly because it was um you know lightweight timber that we were able to extend in and we've done it with fully glue lamb and clt framed um and you get these fantastic looking spaces and the juxtaposition position where the two meet is is really exciting um, you can see the section there in, in Revit showing how much of the extension uh, that we've added without strengthening and some of the finished spaces. Here we've got MEP in the ceiling, you know, um, air conditioning, chilled air, um, which creates a certain amount of kind of clutter, but, but, but allows us to slim down the, the raised floor. Um, that's one way of doing it, which, which, which is, it still looks fantastic. But then this is another um, solution that we've come up with more recently um, which is called technique uh, with um, general projects as the development manager in northern and midland the client and butler gray omen architects in goswell road in clerkenwell again sort of three four story building or, that we've um, increased we've added three floors in in fully um, framed glue lamb and timber and what you can see here is some some gorgeous images i think where the air is in the floor and the chill chilling is in the floor as well so we, ha we do have some options where we have the fresh air in the floor and the and the chill chill beams or fcus in the ceiling but the, there's a kind of a hybrid but this is everything in the floor and you get these beautifully clean uh you know soffits where you've just got lighting and and sprinklers and smoke detectors and the, how well that kind of um matches the existing building down below you can kind of see it's just a contemporary modern version of the same but in super low carbon and sorry i, I sort of went over but you can see how low we're getting down to 80 kilograms a square meter because of the um of carbon because of that we're also diluting the um the benefits of the engineered timber with the overall gia of the retained building so you, you know, it's, it's a double win with a retention and extension in glue lab uh, and then for just finally um this is our exist our office building that i'm sat in at the moment if you may be able to see behind me um i'm in uh, the room on the top left on that top left image um, existing warehouse building we extended to the side and on top in exposed timber um, and you can see 
here, um, north lights to get, daylight's a really important thing in terms of health and well-being. Hopefully that'll get mentioned later. But just people, when they come to visit our office, they run their hands along the walls. There's a smell. I used to say it was a bit like a hamster's a cage, but actually it's much more subtle than that. And it's just, it reminds you that you're somewhere natural and it's a lot of it's subconscious um, as an end user who's now living in a timber building but it, it's kind of wonderful and I think um, everybody's just, you know we moved into this office as we came out of lockdown and it's just been a, an amazing kind of thing for us and very fortunate to be able to do so just to conclude conclude um, engineered timber is probably the best low carbon structural solution available today and when used in conjunction with substantial retention and refurbishment of an existing building like some of the case studies I've just shown I think it's the most potent one-two combo around to help you know, significantly reduce embodied carbon in the built environment. Um, but what I hope today will also demonstrate and what our team is starting to experience in the more modest setting of our own design studio and the added benefits to the health and well-being and overall enjoyment of the individuals working in spaces flooded with natural light like this and the tactile uh, natural surfaces. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Andy. That was um, an excellent presentation, very informative. Um, could everybody, if they've got any questions for Andy, please put them in the chat and we'll pick them up um, at the end. So I will now introduce our next speaker. Um, we have David Storing, who is a director of Morrison Company. David joined Morrison Company in 2008 and has since led the design and delivery of a diverse set of projects with a specific focus on complex mixed-use developments. He has extensive experience working on large-scale retrofit and listed buildings. In addition to this project focus, David leads Morrison Company's sustainability agenda, working to develop a robust vision and roadmap to make sure that projects deliver the highest achievable sustainability targets. David also co-runs the BSc Design and Technology course at the Bartlett School of Architecture, with a focus on emerging technologies and sustainability. Um, I can see you're now sharing your screen, David, so I will now hand it over to you. Thank you. Great. Can, can you hear me? All good. Yep, great. OK, yeah, good afternoon. Yep, my name is David Storing, director at Morrison Company, uh, and also leading the uh, sustainability uh, agenda. So I've got today um, four case studies, um, projects, that I'll run through talking about various different aspects of um, well-being. Um, I'll just start with a quick introduction, just get this to work. Right. David, if it's not moving forward, just take your mouse to the left hand side of your screen, down the bottom of your screen, and it should mm -hmm. give you arrows to move it forward or down. <laughs> oh yeah, that's kind of not, okay, there we go. Hopefully there's a might have to do that, it's a bit annoying, apologies. So yeah, just a bit about us, uh, Morrison Company. So uh, we're architects, uh, we've been around for around 17 years now. We've uh, around 80 strong, both in London and a satellite office in, in Denmark. Um, just to say we're working across all sectors, housing, workplace and community. And that's us outside our um, old office in uh, Underwood Street, we're now moving to a new office. And just in terms of how we work, um, every single project we see is a kind of a unique challenge. Uh, we work a lot through model making. Uh, you'll see lots of timber models there, uh, and you'll see lots of our sort of model making uh, as I go through the, the kind of four different projects. Um, but and, and then, as I said, across working across all sectors, workplace, community, and housing, and that goes from uh, small individual private houses through to kind of larger commercial workspaces. And I've got a mixture of those uh, to run through. In terms of our uh, sustainability agenda, kind of for a resilient future, we are looking closely at LETI um, and also the ROBA 2030 challenge. So these are all the various different aspects of that. Um, and we've been looking to how we measure those, set targets um, within each project. And kind of our, one of our big focuses has been on embodied carbon, uh, which has been talked about previously, and also well-being sitting as part of that, but perhaps a slightly more sort of elusive one in terms of how you how you actually really you know, measure it within uh, within a project. I think I'll talk about various different aspects of that when we go into the projects. So on uh, embodied carbon, as spoken about previously, we've we've done a lot of work also with HTS on 
reducing embodied carbon, looking at timber, looking at regenerative design um, as a, and a kind of a way system shift away from our current way of building, uh, which is kind of destroying the, the, the earth. Um, so kind of this, this quote here about regenerative design and the idea of embedding all human activities into the complex web of the planet Earth and its life support systems. And I think, as I said, we, we've been doing a lot of work on uh, embodied carbon, looking to reduce that. And uh, but I think how it's interesting how when we look at um, well-being, how this idea of regenerative um, being part of um, the Earth system and understanding that, and how timber is, you know, perhaps the most um, evident version of building material that we have that enables us to understand and be part of this of this cycle um in its kind of its in its imperfections and sort of an in, inherent understanding that we all have for timber from its uh from its growth through to uh building through to its kind of end of life um and how that plays out through biofeed and what that means in a building um and as i said four different case studies that i'll run through um Ashton swimming pool um, an office building, Castle and Fitzroy, where we're working with HTS, a uh, wilderness restaurant, um, and a private house, uh, Seagull House. So each of these, a different challenge from a brief, um, all of them very much uh, using timber for various different aspects through from structural, but also I think I'll touch on the kind of what this kind of the wellbeing aspects of them are. So Alfredson Swimming Pool, um, this was a uh, swimming pool for a um, Special Education Needs uh, State Run Academy in um, Buckinghamshire. And the brief for that was to create a very safe environment for learning swimming uh, for, for, as I say, children with special education needs. So the, um, it was this large timber um, structure hovering a meter above um, columns that give a view out onto the, um, the green belt beyond. I'll talk a bit more about that. But the, the qualities of that, um, timber in terms of this kind of relationship both with this view beyond to the green belt um, this softening environment that the hall created but also a really key component of the design at an early stage was to deal with the acoustics that come with um, a kind of a utilitarian pool and the idea of using the ribbing from the timber to start to break up the sound in the space and again make it a, sort of a comfortable environment for the um, for the for the students so that's showing the structure. So it's made up of a series of uh, roof panels and wall panels, all um, just two types, one roof panel, one wall panel, and they're mirrored. And these are the largest panels that you can get on the back of a lorry. It's made up of CLT beams um, and then clad in a, in a cross lamb to become a, um, a stress skin uh, form. And these are models that we produced in house, exploring those geometries. Sorry, I'm struggling with it controls um, and another view there where you're looking underneath uh, and through the hall there you're seeing it in construction um, and a view looking back at the existing school so this kind of pitch um, of the roof uh, reference back to the school um, and, and linking it into into its history there you see a roof panel so this kind of as I say this uh, panel of uh, glue lamb beams with a, 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 a glue lamb a cross lamb skin over and that panel there is the largest panel that you can fit onto the back of the lorry being bolted together. And then a view inside internally there, you start to see this kind of vol voluminous roof above you, um, almost a kind of sculptural form that hovers over you. And as I say, this kind of one meter band that gives you a view out as you're in the pool, but actually provides a, a privacy for the students as they um, kind of assemble around uh, and use the pool. And there you look back and you see the view uh, in relationship to uh, the green belt kind of very, uh, very calming space um, and very much uh, suiting the, uh, the students and that learning environment. And then you look back at the building, again, clad in timber. So you see that raw structural form clad in a, um, a Plato uh, sustainably sourced um, timber and referencing back to a, a, a sort of um, vernacular of a barn sitting within, within the landscape. Then on to the next project. So this project here is um, an office, a uh, large office, 300,000 square foot um, near Old Street. This is working with HTS on this project. This sits within a kind of heritage of a Victorian warehouse building. So externally it sits as a kind of robust concrete masonry frame, but internally, uh, and, and picking up 
previously we've we've looked to use a CLT slab within a steel frame and the kind of articulated uh, beams there, uh, castellated beams picking up the CLT frame. And then the kind of special moment in the building um, where to the atrium, there's a, to the heart of the building, a void runs through where we've got this suspended timber um, deck balcony, which enables a planting light, a breakout from the kind of main office space to kind of shift the kind of normal um, version of a kind of atrium where it becomes a really inhabited atrium, both with people uh, and with planting. So kind of some other views here, you see these suspended um, steel beams holding this, this timber uh, frame. Again, this is about utilizing uh, the, the timber, the kind of link back with the biophilia, which we're bringing into the, into the building, a softening of acoustics also, again, using these, the baffles that you get from the downstand beams. Um, and a sort of a, a different type of opportunity for breaking out of the kind of sealed box that you get um, within uh, the rest of the office into a kind of a, a different space for working, learning, interaction, uh, sharing of ideas. And there are you looking down uh, into the kind of town hall space at the bottom, which is a series of timber steps. And then up on the, up around the atrium on this wraparound deck, uh, using for, for meetings and, and sort of opportunity to say a way to break away from, from the computer. And then on to, to Siegel House. So this is a uh, private house. This is an extension to uh, Walter Siegel's house in Highgate. Uh, and Walter Siegel was a pioneer of um, self-built timber. So this building sits within a landscape. It talks to um, the Walter Seeger method, which is very much about, again, this kind of intrinsic understanding of timber and your ability to build with it. So it's using smaller timbers, um, kind of more human, much more human scale uh, within, uh, within its context. So this is the Walter Seeger method, and he developed a really simple system of using standard sections of timber uh, in a method that can be assembled by, um, by the owners. So it's kind of barn raising. Um, again, sort of a very sort of uh, a very a relationship with timber that these builders would have this kind of uh, as I say these kind of smaller sections so in terms of its facade we used a standard two by two inch uh, timber to create a screen that varies from being transparent um, opening up to a kind of a more solid and then other areas um, kind of tighter grain uh, for ventilation and there you see on the right hand side the existing building and a series of cascading blocks that go down into the landscape, a series of bedrooms, living spaces, each of them kind of nestling, uh, jostling into the landscape uh, with this kind of rhythm of this very small, smaller timbal, this very kind of hand, handed size. And then at night, the various different boxes can be illuminated and you start to see there where the different types of screen is um, either, either open window or a, um, a almost a privacy screen um, so that an overlay of timber would be overlaid onto your views out into the landscape. And then inside the model there, the, each of the blocks has a rotating timber joist. And again, this idea of the movement um, of each of the, of the timber elements within that. And there again, you're looking down um, in the model uh, towards the landscape. And then finally, back to that render where you see uh, the existing building on the right hand side and the series of of uh, three or six jostling uh, timber boxes coming down into the landscape. And then finally, um, Wilderness Restaurant. So this is a, a pavilion uh, within a landscape. Um, it's part of what was Pegasus's life later living scheme. So a, um, uh, within a, a much wider estate and the building, that's the existing Wilderness House that it sits opposite. Um, and riffs off of it. So you can see there this, the arched windows and how that starts to become part of um, the language of the facade, but also sits within this idea of a um, kind of Victoriana pavilion uh, within the landscape. Um, and this is our early model making, um, replicating this, this arch within um, a CLT frame. And then within those, um, sitting on timber columns, a, um, a vaulted, uh, timber arch. So you start to see with this model um, how the various different elements are coming together and we would test this 
in, in our office, and this was built in our workshop. And then how these different um, series of arches replicate themselves onto the facade, forming uh, larger openings with um, vented screens either side, and then a glazed panel, and then shroud in this metal uh, repeated arch on the outside. Another larger model where you're looking up, so kind of worm's eye view where you're looking up at the arches um, within the CLT frame. And there you see on site the, the CLT panels with the arches with the grain um, and the kind of careful attention to the, the, the junctions and the details between those. And there the finished building where you see all the elements coming together from the solid uh, timber columns, um, an element holding the bottom of the arch, um, the CLT arch there, and then a, and then a plywood, birch plywood infill to create the, the complex, more complex geometry of the vaulted arch. And then onto the facade um, and to the bar, you see a, what is a standard oak profile um, used to dress those different elements um, with the view and then framing the view out onto the landscape. And this building actually became a, a real assemblage of, of different species of woods to become a almost a kind of a, a piece of um, almost a jewelry box in terms of consideration for how each of these elements join and what effectively in terms of all the different species becomes a kind of a relationship back out onto the the woods and the uh, 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 and the trees beyond and there you see another view um, framing the view with these vented panels so the the um, the timber panels either side can open up uh, to allow venting into the space so utilization of timber in this space a reference to uh, the history of the building opposite a softening to this environment um, within the context of later living um, acoustics again dealt with within this project um, and about um, creating a, yeah, a, a very special uh, place to go to within um, this estate and that was uh, and that's my final slide thank you uh, thank you very much, uh, David. I'll um, just put my face back on the screen so you can see me. Ah, there we are. Um, fantastic um, series of case studies. They are really showing uh, well the use of uh, timber and design and creating absolutely amazing spaces to be in. Um, so we're moving on now to our final speaker. Uh, we have Beverly Quinn here from the Department of Education. Um, to introduce Beverly, um, in advance of joining the Department of Education in July 2021, Beverly led in thermal comfort, indoor air quality, daylighting and in-use energy and carbon at a leading environmental consultancy covering a range of public and private sector buildings. So since joining the Department for Education, her key role has been focused on driving the Gen Zero research forward, which I believe we're going to hear more about um, in her presentation. So with no further ado, I will hand you over to Beverly. Hi, thanks for that. Can you hear me okay? Yep, Beverly, just before you start, if you just go up to the display settings at the top again and just into the swap. Yep. And that's you. Perfect. Thank you. Right, perfect idea. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me on to speak today. I thought I, I knew that the other speakers would, I suppose, cover the, the kind of um, timber elements. So I thought I would give a bit of an overview on what we are doing kind of client side at the DFE to create healthy buildings. So I'll just kind of move on. Um, so I sit within the design team and, you know, we're looking at people and places because they matter and looking to provide guidance and support on good education environments. And how we do that is looking at setting the standards, support on delivery on the live projects, engage with stakeholders and essentially collect evidence and measure outcomes so that we can actually implement change. So to do so, we are split into five units. So we've got the design and research unit, and that's where the Gen Zero research project was kind of born from. We then have the energy environment and construction unit, which crosses over a lot with the um, DRU unit. Um, there's a lot of focus on energy performance outcomes, the energy pods project, which is low carbon modular plant rooms, which it's kind of come from Gen Zero as well. That's where that's been developed. We then have the assurance um, unit. So that's where we've previously implemented the standards. This is so that 
design advisors from our team can assist on the live projects to make sure that that's all um, going as smoothly as possible and so that we can gather data for the next update. Uh, we also have the safety unit, which is fairly recently developed, um, which will also feed into the next output specification. And the standards team is really bringing everything together, all of the findings, all of the lessons learned, um, and how we can implement that. So our next update will be 2025. Um, so just a quick um, touch upon a couple of things. So as much as um, there isn't just one thing that we focus on to promote health and well-being for the, you know, the, the learners and the teachers, um, there's there's lots of bits. And since um, our output specification in 2017 and between the release um, of our latest, which was November 2021, just last year so much you know has happened we've had the gen zero research with which we've moved forward we have embedded the net zero carbon in operation um we've been doing a lot of um post-occupancy evaluation and building performance evaluation we have the um st mary's biophilic school pilot running lots of other pilots and pathfinders um again to kind of feed into the next update um i won't go on too much um, about that um at the moment but it all the kind of it all kind of comes back to the focus of better spaces and greener places which we focus on within the team so we have three main focus areas so resilient schools and colleges um is one and some of you might recognize this image on the screen it's from it is from the the gen zero research and um really at the moment, as the current school stock stands, the primary schools have, are you know, are they're, you know, they're maybe not quite at the level of this image, but you know, they they have this um, great focus on the outdoors and they have a lot of outdoor learning areas, which is great. But we just we aren't quite there with the secondary schools. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about Gen Zero in a moment. Um, smart construction is another is it kind of the second focus. Um, again, this is another image from our Gen Zero research project. Um, this was, I suppose, the first prototype that was developed, and we are looking to take that forward with additional kind of fully working prototypes, and that ties in with the energy pods as well, which are currently under development. And being an intelligent client, so essentially, we and it's would obviously be really difficult to deliver. Um, any of this so the te the design team and um, that's it within it's formed of typically ex-construction industry professionals which brings everything together so I'm just going to all of these images from the past three slides they've all been from Gen Zero so I'm just going to do a quick focus there um, so what is Gen Zero so it's a major research project um, and really the focus was to the focus was to um look at you know a new platform for buildings an active choice of timber um what what could we do in this research to take across government and form this digital platform to take forward so lots of parts um of gen zero so we have two real life sites that we've taken to stage four and we've got that origin that initial data um that's all been pulled together and now it's you know how do we take this forward so in terms of kind of a bit of a rough plan i suppose um you know we've developed the brief uh we have the kind of strategy in place the design strategy and then we wanted to test products for platform so that was the original prototype and then the other kind of three roughly follow-on prototypes under the sustainable pods banner and then really engage the market we've already although it's not tech we have started this and we've had a lot of interest from other government departments and internationally um and then on our pilot and pathfinder projects we are looking in detail at how which parts we can take from Gen Zero to 
for like retrofit essentially because the existing school stock is like 22,000 schools so we don't want to um, neglect that and only focus on um, taking that forward so a kind of bit of a bit of a way to go and um, that research to from the beginning till now there's been a lot of um, involvement from from others which we're very grateful for um, so I'm just going to kind of run through so in terms of creating these healthy environments one of the focuses is um you know covered outdoor learning areas and um just having outdoor green space where possible it's some of the sites are really um restricted so it's not always possible at this scale but that's um what we're looking at and looking at different sites and how we can apply this and again i think i'd already had this image up but really you know how can we bring this into a secondary school setting for the benefit of the learners there's obviously so much um data and research that looks at you know the benefits of biophilic design and on you know everybody's health and well-being and in terms of the the use of the the homegrown mass timber so essentially this um this is what we have in mind really this is the, the research was focused on an active choice of timber we wanted to investigate the you know the, vi the viability of that you know was it possible um can we do this like will it work long term so we're still it, we're still i suppose in the early phases of that um you'll probably notice you know there's no additional paints or finishes it's all been left very exposed um we don't want to bring in any additional VOC levels when it's not necessary. Um, so, and this is, we'd be using timber throughout the building, um, ideally. And to develop, to take this forward and to develop this, um, we had the kit of parts um, developed into one prototype. So this is just some images from the system technologies factory in Invergordon with the production of the prototype and then some at um, best I'm um, using the vacuum press and some with transportation so I suppose the transportation is really important because if we were to do this on mass scale you know we'd be looking for the off-site manufacturing and then bringing it in and assembly on site um this is the classroom um itself the, the prototype um this is not the the final floor um essentially the the floors are timber concrete composite and the the reason behind that is was that we've in the stage four um findings we've looked at the embodied carbon with different floor finishes and replacing those um, so like carpets or you know other other uh, materials, and just having the least amount of concrete as possible is um has come out as a good solution. And um, we are currently having those developed and seeing how we can finish those off. And um, so we'll have that information soon. Um, just a couple of more images of the classroom, and I just kind of wanted to move on how can we move how are we moving forward what kind of support do we have um what's the direction of travel that we're going in so last just two minutes left, Beverly. oh okay thanks i'm just about Thank done you. um so we had our overall dfe sustainability and climate change strategy launched and within the strategy so we it was at the natural history museum we had lots of great speakers um promoting the strategy and the strategy has five main areas and within the strategy which we can drop a link in and it'd be great if everyone could have a little read um essentially there is a commitment to construct four gen zero schools and one fe college by 2025 so we do have the, the you know the backing for this and you know we're, we're and there's so many other um kind of promotions of um what we can do in terms of health and well-being for the learners and the teachers um, which is which is great. Um, there's other bits that kind of bring it all together, which maybe aren't construction related. So there's the Climate Leaders Award um, and things like that. So and, and also looking at 
climate education so we engaged with a lot of young people to inform the strategy and climate anxiety came up quite a lot so that's been covered and um, the strategy was also reviewed by you know young learners um, and that feedback was taken on board and um, so there is a, a wider vision and a wider kind of um, take on it which is great um, I think that's just that's just that. So we exhibited at the Natural History Museum um, a little cutaway of the Gen Zero prototype just to um, further bring this out. And I suppose a lot of people had read the strategy, but they probably didn't know much about Gen Zero and much about the timber construction. So we tried to kind of um, bring that all together. I, well, I did have a video to show, but I don't think it's going to play. Um, so I think hopefully that gives a good overview of what we are doing at the DFE to try and bring everything together and create these healthier spaces. So it's not just, um, there's just there are lots of bits to come together. So thank you very much. Thank you, Beverly. Um, it's really exciting times for educational buildings. Um, certainly moved on considerably when, then, since when I was at school, I have to say. Um, so uh, that's it for our three um, presenters uh, today. But we've got another poll, and then we're going to go into a short panel session. So please stay bear with us. Um, if you could bring the poll up on the screen, Danielle. What do you think is the greatest barrier to creating healthy spaces? lack of buy-in, money, lack of understanding or knowledge or not seen as important. If you, if the answer will just pop up shortly. Or the answer, what you've decided. Is it going to pop up? Oh, lack of understanding or knowledge. Yeah, and hopefully sessions like this, and we have run a, a previous session, um, that is um, around about the science of of healthy healthy buildings. So hopefully things like this are are are, are helping to address that lack of knowledge. So if I can get all of our panelists to put their cameras back on, I've got some questions here for you. There we go. I can see Andy and Beverly and David. Yay! Brilliant. That's it. So um, I will just kick off with one um, from Beverly, since you have just finished speaking there. So do you have plans to carry out post-occupancy surveys to monitor the impact of learning and well-being in the Gen Zero school? Yeah, yes, we do. So we have plans for post-occupancy evaluation and building performance evaluation as well. And our ICT colleagues have teamed up with Cisco and they're doing this whole kind of living lab um, indoor air quality monitoring as well. So there's lots of lots of bits coming together. We're also conducting post occupancy post occupancy evaluations of the existing school stock to see what we can do in terms of ventilation, indoor air quality, and thermal comfort. So there's lots happening. Um, I think there's so much happening. We're just trying to like bring all that data together to inform S25. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Beverly. Um, another question here for Andy. Um, what things were the most important um, to the Hain Tillett Steel team when redesigning, creating your new office space post COVID? Did the experience of staff members' well being play a key role? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's interesting actually. When some, we've given lots of tours in the last um, few months since we moved in, and um, originally I feel like um, you know, timber, engineer timber was becoming an increasingly kind of common thing, and it, we were seeing it as potential showcase for our clients and um, you know and and uh, architectural friends and etc. But actually, the real benefit I think is in talent retention nowadays, and you know, and keep, keeping staff and attracting the best staff, and that's probably a bigger benefit than what we thought maybe originally, which was a which was a great showcase for you know to, maybe to win more work. So, so yeah, yeah. It, whether it was you know initially kind of part of the brief, I'm not sure, but it's certainly become the main driver going forwards. Okay, that's great. One here for David. Um, do you think there is a link between designing healthier buildings for occupants and more sustainable buildings? Um, yeah, I mean the examples that we show today, they're all they'll all show a, a, a massive reduction over their counterparts 
uh, made out of concrete or, or steel. Um, so on a kind of a, an embodied carbon front, um, it's a, as I think as Andy as Andy said, it's a it's an easy easy win for sure. And I suppose in a way, um, a, a lot of our reasons for pushing the timber was for the for the uh, the embodied side. And I think there's they're, they're, yeah, they're, they all they all the, the um, advantages on the well-being uh, come come along with them, don't they? Yeah, it's so just hand in hand, doesn't it? Yeah, mm. definitely. Not perfect. Um, another one for Beverly. Um, what design trends do you think you um, you'll be adopting in future classrooms? So, did you say design trends? Yes. Um, What's coming next? Do you think? Well, I suppose what what we are trying to get to come next is the the Gen Zero classroom you know with all the exposed timber that, that I'd brought up on the screen I mean at the moment in our current specification we we took as much as we could from gen zero at that point in time so we've got like the net zero carbon in operation but we just didn't have we didn't I suppose have any gathered data on um, you know, using timber in the kit of parts and taking that forward that, that we could, you know, there's probably, there's loads out there, but, you know, we didn't have anything that we could. So I think that's that's um, the next um, step, really, and, and whether that, you know, whether that makes it in by 2030 or if it takes a little bit longer, I think that's that's the, the vision, really. Yes, well, it's no small feat. How many buildings or how many educational establishments did you say were in the... Yeah, so it's yeah, this, the existing school stock is 22,000, and then we have the commitment of 50 new builds a year. Right, okay. So quite considerable then. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, one last question for Andy. Um, when did you start to see the step change for, from clients towards building with sort of health and well-being built in? Um, what do you think was the driver? Did it go hand in hand with the whole conversation about climate change or do you feel was it something else? Um, yeah, it's a good question. My, I, I think it's probably a bit of, bit of both. I think not only in terms of um, climate change and increasing awareness and, and the responsibility and the desire to sort of do, do better, but also just, um, I don't know, increasingly we've been taking ceilings out of existing buildings and showing structures off. Um, like I say, there's almost a sort of a, what was a sort of a trend, you know, the Soho house kind of look where everything's a little bit rustic and stripped back and honest and, and more textural. Um, so it's almost like, a I wouldn't call it a fashion because I, I honestly think it's here to stay, but a sort of a change in the way we, you know, may, maybe Dave, Dave could sort of comment further on that. Yeah, I mean, there's a sort of, I mean, it's just a relaxedness that comes um, with a kind of the rawness somehow. I suppose there's a there's a sensibility of 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 perhaps a bit more home and texture that kind of got stripped away by kind of some modernity and some kind of you know wipe clean surfaces that that lose the kind of story. Um, and bringing that back, I think, is it's 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 all it's all all good stuff. And yeah, as you say. Will we go back to a sort of a super cleansed world? I suppose there was a worry that COVID would start to create that again, like the idea of having these white cleanable spaces. Um, but let's. You haven't hope. seen that yet so far. No, no. No. Good, good. Perfect. Well, thank you very much all for um, your time today. Um, just before we uh, disappear off screen, we've got another quick poll for everybody. It comes up on the screen. Let's see. There we go. So hopefully this is going to be an answer that um, uh, is going to be yes. But you know, after today's webinar, do you think uh, you'll be more aware of how a building enhances health and well-being? If you all say no, that's going to be a disaster. <laughs> yes, hey, eighty-two percent. That's fantastic. Brilliant. Um, well, I've, I've got nothing else to, to add today, just to say to everybody, thank you very much for, for listening in. Thank you very much to the speakers for, for participating. Um, the um, 
recording of the webinar will be available in um, a couple of days. Um, and after the event, we will send out a feedback form. So if you would please just take a couple of minutes, that helps us um, shape the, all our future events and make them better. Um, and it's all for, um, for you as the audience. We do these things, so it's, your feedback is really, really important. So um, thanks again, um, and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks very well. Bye. Bye.